Hello guys. So today I am going to discuss a very important topic and uh, you must be happy because this is a requested topic. Many of you sent me the request uh, at the different platforms to take this topic of ocular ischemic syndrome. So let's get started. If you look at the ischemic eyeball pain. So why do we have pain uh, in our eyeball who is having the ischemia? So if you see this, Whenever we have ischemia, there will be damage to the optic nerve fibers as well as to the retinal cells. So, uh, whenever you are having the ocular ischemic syndrome, what is having? We are having the hypoperfusion and uh, the main problem of this hypoperfusion is taking place secondary to the occlusion of a very, very important vessel that is the carotid artery. So most of the time when we have got more than, whenever you have more than 90% carotid stenosis, uh, we are having this ocular ischemic syndrome. That means uh, there are certain presentations that you are uh, going to have in cases of this uh, ocular ischemic syndrome, uh, which are actually secondary to hyperperfusion and hyperperfusion is when uh, mostly more than 90% stenosis of this carotid artery is taking place. Now, before we go into the details, there are certain important points. What is actually ischemia? So, ischemia is actually the decrease of the blood supply to a tissue. It could be uh, local and we all know that the most important cause locally is your thrombus or embolism. So, thromboembolism is a very very important cause that can take place even by the cholesterol crystals which are called as your holland host plaques or it could be you know diffuse at a global level due to a low perfusion pressure that means if i am having ischemia in the eyeball um, either i will have to search for any thrombus search for any embolus or you have to go for a low perfusion pressure anything that is signifying that there is a low perfusion pressure in the eyeball all right second important thing is hypoxia now how is ischemia different from hypoxia hypoxia is the lack of oxygen to any of the tissue and due to any of the cause so certainly there is a difference between the ischemia and the hypoxia but though uh, both of them are interrelated and then we have got a syndrome. Syndrome means a group of symptoms which are occurring most of the times together. That is called as a syndrome. Now, what do you mean by stenosis? Stenosis means abnormal narrowing of the blood vessels. So, these are the common terms that you are going to hear whenever you are discussing a case of ocular ischemic syndrome. What is perfusion pressure? Perfusion pressure means uh, the pressure gradient that is driving the coronary blood pressure. Uh, gradient means what is the actual difference the difference between the diastolic aortic pressure and the right atrial and diastolic pressure so uh, whatever is the difference that is coming that is called as the perfusion pressure again uh, if you go back to your physiology your medicine this term becomes very very important and here you have this idea that you can get a integrated question therefore we can get a integrated MCQ on this ocular ischemic syndrome. Uh, sometimes they may start with the entirely a medicine problem and uh, the patient is having low perfusion pressure or something like this and they may end up asking you the ophthalmology thing or it could be other way around also. They start with the ophthalmology problem, ocular symptoms and then they end up asking the systemic cause. Okay. So let us see the etiology. Etiology may this ocular ischemic syndrome is a rare condition. So it's not that common, but yes, certainly it's a emergency and it is resulting due to a chronic ocular hyperperfusion. And this hyperperfusion is secondary to the carotid artery stenosis. Most of the time it is unilateral and um, 80% I think is a good number. So though I will not say that it is always unilateral, but yes, more than uh, most of the cases, more than 80% of the cases are unilateral. And it is a chronic insufficiency of the ophthalmic artery. And this ophthalmic artery we know is the main blood supply of our eyeball. So the reduced perfusion of the entire eyeball is there. And we know that the most common cause is the carotid stenosis. Okay. Now coming towards the pathogenesis part. This chronic ocular hypoperfusion is mostly 
secondary to the ipsilateral atherosclerotic carotid artery stenosis so if uh, we are having because we know that uh, mostly unilateral it is unilateral 80% of the time and we have this carotid artery stenosis uh, so that side whichever side we are having the carotid artery stenosis uh, it is more than 90% okay so when we are having uh, the atherosclerosis or any cause due to which we are having more than 90% carotid artery stenosis that will result in 50% reduction of the perfusion pressure. So as soon as you are getting the stenosis more than 50% of the perfusion pressure is reduced which is actually sufficient to cause the ischemia and the hypoperfusion. Then it typically affects the patients during the 7 decade. And uh, there are number of risk factors which we already know. We have diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart diseases and we have the cerebrovascular diseases. So very, very important are all these risk factors uh, and some of them will definitely be present in your question if they are presenting with the clinical scenario of the uh, what you call as ocular ischemic syndrome. Now talking about this carotid stenosis, carotid stenosis is actually uh, referring to the atherosclerotic occlusive carotid artery disease and uh, most of the times it is associated with ulcers. We have ulceration present at the bifurcation of the common carotid artery. So most of the times we are having atherosclerosis and due to the atherosclerosis we have carotid artery stenosis and uh, we can also have the ulcers at the bifurcation so if i am talking about the uh, pathology part these are the findings what are the risk factors again we have got the males it's more common in males that we already know and uh, elderly age growth we have smoking we have um, diabetes we have got hypertension hyperlipidemia so most of the times either of these combinations elderly male with some of these risk factors will be there in your question now, what will be the presenting manifestations? That is the most important aspect. So, mostly you are going to get these four things. So, whenever you are getting any of these four things, always think about the ocular ischemic syndrome. The first is your amyrosis fugax. That is transient ischemic attacks could be there. So, whenever my patient is coming with the amyrosis fugax or patient is coming with the um, retinal artery occlusion we can have transient retinal ischemic attacks also we can have uh, TIA is very very important you can have transient ischemic attacks of the brain we can have syncopal attacks transient visual obscuration could be there or we can have a very very important thing the asymmetrical diabetic retinopathy if you remember sometime back i had also posted one question where the patient was having pdr in uh, one eye and npdr in another eye and the answer was with respect towards this ocular ischemic syndrome because one of the very very common presentation of the ocular ischemic syndrome is the asymmetric diabetic retinopathy and mostly we get confused between the diabetic retinopathy there and uh, we'll end up giving the wrong answer so whenever i am having the transient retinal ischemic attacks or we are having the arterial occlusion or i'm having the cerebral ischemic attacks or we are having the asymmetrical diabetic retinopathy these are the common presentations of the patient now what are the symptoms uh, if you look at the symptoms, we can have the loss of vision, obviously that is but obvious, we are having the ischemia of the eye and the main blood supply is affected, so loss of vision is there and a patient can come up with the myrosis fugax, patient may come up with the blackouts, patient may give you history of syncopal attacks, uh, there could be pain, pain could be um, periocular, it could be periorbital and some of the patients are also coming with the delayed dark adaptation so if you are having the typical risk factors you are having the uh, evidence of hypoperfusion you are having evidence of thromboembolism carotid artery stenosis and the patient is presenting with the loss of vision we have uh, blackouts we have um, periorbital pain periocular pain we have the delayed dark adaptation you should keep this uh, ocular ischemic syndrome in your mind what are the signs? Signs may we have the features of a hyperperfusion. Like for example, if I talk about cornea, we have edema, we have stria. Anterior chamber will also show the signs of inflammation. This is called as the ischemic pseudoiritis. 
uh, whenever you have got ischemia, we have inflammation. So it's not the real inflammation, but yes, it is mimicking. That's why it is called as the pseudoiritis. Then we have a uh, pupil mid dilated, poorly reacting. And uh, because you have a lot of hyperperfusion and ischemia in the anterior segment, iris is going to be uh, having the neovascularization, rubiosis iritis, and we have the atrophic patches also. Now, again, complicated cataract you can have in the patient, neovascular glaucoma could be there. So, a uh, whole chain of ischemia to inflammation to the neovascularization and the neovascularizer, uh, neovascular glaucoma. I think this is the whole chain that is taking place. All right. Now, looking at the appearance. So, first is your anterior segment examination. Now, once you start examining this patient, what are the things that we are going to have? So, we are going to have um, the appearance of all of the pseudo iritis. So, I am having this um, diffuse episcleral injection also. We have corneal edema. We have the flare. We have patches of iris atrophy. But one thing is different uh, talking about the pupil. Pupil is not constricted. Rather, it is mid dilated and poorly reacting pupil. So, that is the thing that will help us to differentiate that it is not a true uveitis. It is a pseudo iritis. We have rubiosis iritis, we have cataract and even glaucoma could be there, right? Now, once you go with the fundus examination, look at the vein. So, there would be venous dilatation, calibers will also be irregular, but no or mild tortuosity. Now, again, this will help you to differentiate. This will um, differentiate it from the CRVO. Many a times we are confused whether it is a case of ocular ischemic syndrome or CRVO. So, CRVO will always have much more tortuosity in comparison to the ocular ischemic syndrome. We have the retinal um, arterial narrowing that is also there. Arterial narrowing is there. Then we have dot and blot hemorrhages also. We have microaneurysms and cotton wool spots. So, now, if you see on one hand, we have microaneurysms, we have dot and blot hemorrhages, we have got um, this uh, cotton wool spots which are uh, going towards this anpedia. And on the other hand, we also have the neovascularization. So, that is the way how uh, it could be presenting with the asymmetrical. That is why it could be presenting with the asymmetrical diabetic retinopathy, a very, very important presentation here. And uh, as goes with the diabetic retinopathy, macular edema is a common complication. Now, most of the times, uh, if you look at this person, he is a male, elderly and diabetic patient. So, diabetic retinopathy with ocular ischemic syndrome is a very common coincidence and therefore, they are having already diabetic retinopathy where the most common uh, cause of the loss of vision is a maculopathy. So, macular edema is there. But the presentation of the ocular ischemic syndrome will be mostly asymmetrical diabetic retinopathy. Uh, if you look at the angiography, we know that uh, whenever we have the diabetic retinopathy, there is a breakdown of inner blood retinal barrier. So, angiography will obviously be the most important investigation and uh, it is showing me the delayed choroidal filling and also prolonged AV transit time is also there. So, if you look at the early phase, this is showing me the delayed choroidal filling. It is also showing the uh, arteriovenous uh, transit time prolonged. While if you go for the late phase, we have got the neovascularization. So, late phase will show me the disc as well as the perivascular hyperfluorescence and we also have the leakage. So, again, uh, the FFA will be very, very typical of the diabetic retinopathy. These are the things that you are going to uh, get. You can see the venous dilatation. We can see the hemorrhages. We can see that there are hard exudates. Choroidal filling is also late. And uh, we can have also have the leakage at the posterior pole. So, there are so many things that you can see in cases of ocular ischemic syndrome that you know with respect to the diabetic retinopathy. If you have ischemia, um, then, um, then you will have neovascularization and uh, due to the neovascularization, we will have the bleeding. So, hemorrhages are also there, uh, ischemia at the macula due to which we have got the dark color in the macular area. You can see this also, this uh, macula is dark. So, this is actually a ischemic maculopathy. All right. Um, what is the important investigation? So, obviously, the main uh, problem that we are facing here is the carotid artery stenosis. So, best investigation is your color Doppler ultrasonography. We can also do the digital subtraction angiography or MR angiography. 
So whenever you are having the uh, ocular ischemic syndrome, try to look at them. You are going to get any of them. Uh, color Doppler is there. We have got um, uh, DSA or we have MR angiographies. So obviously angiography will be the best one because you are looking directly into the vessel. Now, once you know the problems, uh, how to manage it? So, if you look at the anterior segment manifestations, so, uh, we are going to treat it with the steroids and midriatrics because uh, it is just like the aritis which is taking place. Uh, yes, then you have to treat the complications. If you are having neovascular glaucoma, try to treat it with the medicines. You can give the anti-VEGF agents. You can also do the surgery. Uh, if there is a proliferative uh, retinopathy, you have to go for the PRP and uh, if there is a macular edema, intravitreal steroids, anti-VEGF agents and even the carotid surgery could be done. So treatment is not a one, uh, one uh, you know, one uh, cornerstone that you can give this. You have to uh, go for the multifold according to the complications, according to the clinical features, you have to treat it. All right. Now, important thing is the differential diagnosis. So there are certain things that you should always see and that you can have with respect to the ocular ischemic syndrome. And first is your non-ischemic CRVO. And I told you also that uh, the most important thing is the venous tortuosity. Um, in cases of the CRVO, the veins are always more tortuous. We have more hemorrhages. While if you look at the perfusion, that will be normal. We will be also having the disc edema. Uh, similarity is that both will have your hemorrhages, both will show venous dilatation, both will show the cotton wool spots. But once you look at the amount of tortuosity, amount of hemorrhages, then you got to see the difference. Second important thing is diabetic retinopathy itself because we are having microaneurysms, dot and blot hemorrhages, heart exudates, neovascularization. Yes, so we can confuse it with the diabetic retinopathy. But um, if you look here, this is usually bilateral with the characteristic heart exudates. So diabetic retinopathy is usually bilateral and we have a very, very characteristic heart exudates. Well, this was more than 80% unilateral. And the third important thing is hypertension retinopathy because um, like the hypertension retinopathy, we are having arterial or narrowing also, we are having hemorrhages as well as cotton wool spots. But this is usually the hypertension retinopathy is bilateral, uh, similar to the diabetic retinopathy. While uh, if you go for the ocular ischemic syndrome, more than 80% it was unilateral. And uh, we are not having much of the venous changes in the hypertension retinopathy, uh, the NVD or the NV. We know that new vascularization will never, never take place in the hypertension retinopathy. So these changes will definitely help you a lot in making the final diagnosis because whenever you are having a question on ocular ischemic syndrome, I'm sure you are going to have this ischemic CRV or diabetic retinopathy hypertension retinopathy and fourth year ocular ischemic syndrome as the um, answer. So how to actually go about it? That is the most typical part. We may know the diabetic retinopathy, hypertension retinopathy or uh, the CRV or ocular ischemic syndrome separately. But the main thing is how to differentiate them and reach into the one final answer. So I hope this uh, video will definitely help you in solving the questions of ocular ischemic syndrome and uh, uh, looking forward for uh, many such topics i'll try to bring more of the uh, videos with respect to the small topics which will help you in solving the clinical solving the clinical scenarios till then goodbye thank you and happy ophthalmology